Um, balance my sound good. Something is amiss a bit. I don't know if it's a monitor or I need to hear myself good. The second one, let's look at Romans chapter 12. That is our pilot scripture, Romans chapter 12. From verse 4. Romans 12 from verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individual members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. He, sorry, or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, and he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who sows mercy with cheerfulness. So we've looked at prophecy. Today I want us to look at ministry. Somebody say ministry. That word ministry simply means service or help or the ministry of help or helps. Now, there are two Greek words for this gift of ministry. The first Greek word, I'm going to be giving you a lot of Greek words. So if you have lacked names for your children, you can use one of the Greek words for those who are still giving birth. Now, the first one is diaconia. So you can call your son Diaconia Omondi or Diaconia Karaoke or Diaconia. Put your name. So Diaconia is found in Romans chapter 12 and it means to wait tables. Somebody say wait tables. Now, this picture is that of a waiter who waits at the table and offers food and drinks to the guests. If you've gone to a hotel, which I'm sure all of us have, there is a waiter who waits on you, waits on your order. So whatever you order, he's able to bring to you. So Diaconia has the idea of waiting, you know, at the table, just waiting to serve the people who have come to the restaurant and they want to eat food. They can order ugali or rice or chapati or juice or whatever they can order. The person that brings to them is a waiter. And so Diaconia has the idea of waiting to be able to serve people. Another word that signifies ministry is antilepsis. Antilepsis and is found in First Corinthians chapter twelve, verse twenty-eight. The Bible mentions the word "helps." Somebody say "helps." So that word "antilepsis" is translated "helps" or "helping." You see, the waiter helps you to get your order. So this gift or spiritual gift of ministry is about helping. Is about serving. Is about waiting on others. The ministry of help, therefore, is the spirit-given capacity to serve by rendering practical help in both physical and spiritual matters. I will say that again. The ministry or the spiritual gift of ministry, the spiritual gift of ministry is the spirit-given capacity to serve by rendering practical help in both physical and spiritual matters. The spiritual gift of ministry, ladies and gentlemen, has to do with the caring of the needs of others and the lightening of the burden of the ministry. Even when 
it requires doing mundane or manual tasks. It has to do with caring for the needs of others. It has to do with practical ministry, lightening the burden of the ministry, even if it means doing the mundane or the manual tasks. The crux of the spiritual gift of ministry is practical ministry or practical service. And the Holy Spirit has granted this gift to us so that we may not have the boss mentality within the church. This gift has been given to us so that we don't throw our weight around and feel very important not to serve in the church. Today I'm going to say some very deep things. The Holy Spirit has endowed believers with this gift so that we may fill the gaps in the church, the gaps in the ministry, meet the needs that are in the church so that the church may be able to fulfill the great commission. And so this gift makes you humble. This gift this gift, spiritual gift of ministry or service or helps, you know, gives you the attitude of a servant. It makes you become a servant in the house of God. You're willing to work. You're willing to serve. You're willing to care for the needs of, that, uh, of others. You're willing to help. There's something that you will decide that you're going to do in the church, in the house of God that will minister to others, and at the same time, it will fill in the gaps in the church to assist the church in fulfilling the Great Commission. Ladies and gentlemen, those with this gift are not kings, but they are kingmakers. Let me wait for that to sink. They are not kings, but they are kingmakers. They are content with serving in the background to make others enjoy the limelight and be a blessing to the church. So this gift is manifested in different departments within the church. We see this gift in the ushering department. We see this gift when it comes to feeding the poor, clothing the naked, singing in the choir or in the worship team, cleaning the church, arranging the seats, cooking meals for people to eat, driving the church bus. One of these fine days we shall have a church bus in Jesus' name. Organizing events, protocol, security, sound department, media, outreach. So this gift has to do with practical service. And as I continue moving, you'll discover that this is one of the gifts that God has given every believer. Every believer is a recipient of the spiritual gift of ministry. God expects you to do something with your life, with your gift, with your, uh, with, your, with your time, with your resources in his house, to care for the needs of the others, to fill in the gaps in the church so that the church can be able to fulfill the great commission. So it's a gift for all of us. Look at your neighbor and tell them, you have this gift. Turn to another one and tell them, you also have this gift. All of us, the moment you are born again, you become a recipient of the spiritual gift of ministry. You become a recipient of the ministry of helps. You, you are supposed to help. You are supposed to support. You are supposed to be a waiter. All of us are supposed to be waiters. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, hello, waiter. Every believer is a recipient of the gift of ministry because there is something you can do in the house of God. There is a gap you can fill in the house of God. There is something that you can do that can refresh your brother, refresh your sister, can make the church stronger, can make the church, you know, fulfill the great commission. There is something all of us can do. If you can't sing, you can sweep. If you can't sweep, you can arrange the chairs. If you cannot arrange the chairs, you can hook up sound. If you can't hook up the sound, you can help with the media department. If you can't help with the media department, you can join the outreach and help out. 
If you can't be in the outreach, you can teach the children's church. If you can't be with the children because you're, you have a short fuse. <laughs> you can clean the toilet. There is always a gap in the church that needs to be filled with the children of God. So it's a gift for all of us. Somebody say, it's a gift for all of us. And I'll prove to you. Mark chapter 9 verse 35. The Bible says, and he sat down. This is Jesus. Called the twelve. And he said to them, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. He was telling the disciples, you want to be elevated? You want to be a leader? You want to be up there? You must be a servant of all. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9, the Bible says, for we, for we are God's fellow workers. Another translation says, for we are God's fellow laborers. We are workers. We are supposed to be workers. We are working with God. We are doing something in the house of God. We have to do something in the house of God. We have to partner with God and work in the house of God and fill the gaps. Somebody say gaps. Say again gaps. That's why you should not complain when you see gaps. God is opening your eyes so that you may fill that gap. You're quiet, but I'm preaching. Yeah, when you see a gap, it's for you to fill it. Not for you to complain and to criticize. It's for you to do what? To fill that gap because we are God's fellow workers. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13. The Bible says, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Give me some monitors a little bit. Only do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Tell your neighbor you're supposed to serve me. And I'm supposed to serve you. Yes, we are supposed to serve one another. As you do your part, as I do my part, we are serving one another. So, so, so if all of us come here with the boss mentality, we will never serve one another. And if you're in this church, after this message, you must fill a gap in this church. You can't just be coming, eating, belching, and going home. There is a gap. You must fill it. You must fill a gap. Tell you, nobody, there's a gap you must fill. Yes, the Bible says, minister to one another, serve one another. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work. God will not remember your laziness. God will remember your work, your diligence, something that you are doing in his house. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. He will not forget your work. If you're here and you're in the ISAF team, I want you to know that God will never forget your work. Coming early in the morning to serve, God will never forget your work. Staying after everybody has gone to clear the church compound and to clean it, God will never forget your work and your labor of love. Let those who live early leave. You stay and do what needs to be done. Arrange the seats, clean the toilet, clean the church, put everything together. I want you to know that God will never forget your labor of love. What an encouragement this morning. He will never forget. It is recorded in heaven. Even Jesus demonstrated this gift. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. He came to minister. He didn't come to be ministered to. Even though he was God, he deserved to be ministered to. But the Bible says he didn't come to be ministered to. He came to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. At the heartbeat of his visit on the face of the earth was service. He came to minister. He came to serve. He didn't come as a boss. He came as a servant. As soon as he arrived here, he said, at your service. And he started serving us. In the book of Revelation chapter 2, there is a church in Thyatira which was known for works, love, 
faith, patience, but also for service. That church was full of servants. I pray that the city of transformation will be like this church. A church that is full of servants. A church that is full of people who are exercising the gift of ministry. The gift of service. The gift of helps. They are ready to help when they are called upon to do something in the house of the Lord. So these scriptures, ladies and gentlemen, point to one thing. That every believer has been granted this gift. We have the spiritual gift of ministry, the ability to offer practical service that will benefit the church and others. And therefore, we must volunteer. Somebody say volunteer. We must volunteer to serve in the church. We must volunteer our time. We must volunteer our gifts. We must volunteer our talents to serve in church-related projects. And sometimes you must volunteer without requiring for payment. Only one person is clapping. You must volunteer and say, I'm going to give it to God. This is my offering. This is my sacrifice. I'm going to volunteer my ex uh, expertise. I'm going to volunteer my experience to the church. I'm volunteering what God has blessed me with so that I may fill what? The gaps. Somebody say the gaps. Shout it louder, the gaps. I'll volunteer. It also means you have to be available. I will show up. I will not be too busy. I will show up because I have this gift. Remember, this gift has been given to all of us. So I will be available. I will show up. I'll be, always be there. When I'm needed, I will show up. I will set aside time to be there, to be in the house of God, and to do whatever is required, and to fill the gap that I see in the church. It also means that I'll be diligent. You will be diligent. You will do it with all your heart. You put your soul into it. When you sing, your soul will be in the singing. When you usher, you do it with all your heart. You know, I can, tell, I can tell if somebody is passionate about something and, 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 and somebody else who is not passionate about something. Two singers can sing. One you will see passion, another one you will not see passion. Two preachers can preach. One you will see passion, another one you will see this guy is just trying to fulfill a day. You have to be diligent. In what you're doing. Your heart is in it. Your mind is in it. Your soul is in it. Amen. Yeah, I can welcome you with passion. And I can welcome you as if I've been forced to stand at the door. Yeah. I can direct you to a seat with dignity. But I can direct you to a seat by just pointing you to the seat. It's true. Diligence. Somebody say diligence. And then you have to be willing to sacrifice. There should be a degree of sacrifice. Look, I want you to know as a Christian, the Bible is based on sacrifice. You're quiet. But I'm telling you the truth. The Bible is based on sacrifice. These days of serving God out of convenience are over. Those, those days are over. Oh, I will do it when I have time. I'll come when I'm free. Please, stay with your service. It will not even move God. I will do it when I have time. I will try and squeeze in some few minutes. When I'm free, then I can do it. That will never move God. What moves God is sacrifice. Because the Bible is based on sacrifice. The Bible is a bloody book. A lot of sacrifices have been made in the Bible from the book of Genesis all the way to Revelation. It's about sacrifice. Even the first few chapters we see sacrifice. An animal died for Adam to wear a designer suit. It is sacrifice. Some of you get it when you're having lunch. It's sacrifice. Jesus coming, sacrifice. Moses had to sacrifice his calling, sacrifice his comfort to be with the children of Israel. It's about sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. And ladies and gentlemen, we can't serve God out of convenience. There has to be a degree of sacrifice. Hallelujah. 
And I'm so glad that even the church is away from your house. I'm so happy. I'm so excited. Thank you, Lord, for taking the church away from where we live. Because you want us to offer sacrifices. So tell your neighbor, me coming this morning is a sacrifice. I'm telling you, it's a, it's a sacrifice. That is what moves the heart of God. The other day I was having a conversation with another bishop. Oh, it was yesterday. I was having another conversation, a conversation with another bishop. I met him. And he told me, have you noticed something? That people who live far from church appreciate the church more than the people who live near the church. Isn't it true? I can't sit in a bus for 30 minutes to come here and play. I can't drive on Kiungani Road and then come here and play. It is a sacrifice to come. When I get here, I'm very serious with God. It's a sacrifice. Where there is sacrifice, there is seriousness. But where there is convenience, there is no seriousness. And so, when you understand that you have this gift, it will demand that you sacrifice. Somebody say sacrifice. Now, what is the purpose of the gift of ministry? I'm going to give you, how many do you want? <laughs> All right, I'll give you what I can. The purpose of the gift of ministry, which all of us have, or service, or helps, number one, is to support the needy. Do you know that we are surrounded with a lot of needy people around us? People don't have food, people are sick, people are lost, people are broken, people are disappointed, people are handicapped. We have a lot of needs around us. So God has given us, all of us, this gift so that we can be able to support the needy. In your own way, look for ways of helping someone. Praise the Lord. In your own ways. Somebody say my own ways. In your own ways, look for ways of helping someone. Hallelujah. Some of you, I can see your wardrobe in the spirit. It's almost crashing because of the shoes, the clothes, which you don't wear. You're waiting for the day you lose weight. You're not losing weight. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, let it go, let it go, let it go. Have I seen you? Have I seen right? Am I a seer this morning? Have I seen right? Look for ways you can be a blessing to someone because you have the gift of ministry inside of you. You have the gift of helps, of service. Look for ways of putting a smile on somebody else's face. Can I hear an amen? You have so many shoes, so many clothes. You have too much food in your fridge. Your fridge is almost falling sideways. In fact, even you can't, you can't even lock the door. Sometimes you have to force the door to be locked. Look for ways you can be a blessing to someone. Praise the Lord. There is a lady I, have, I will never forget when I was single. And I was still struggling financially. And one time I didn't have food. And the Lord spoke to her to bring me food. She cooked food. And she brought food to my house. And she was not interested in me. She was obeying God. You see the way, the way you're wicked. Look at the way you're wicked. The, your mind is so corrupted. You can be a blessing to someone without strings attached. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not because you want to get something out of it, but because you're obeying God. God is speaking to you. And that's what I'm telling you. Look for opportunities to be a blessing to someone. 
Not because you want to get something out of it, but because you're exercising the gift of service. You see, the world has become so bad that even sometimes when you see a lady stuck by the road and she's trying to change the tire and you offer to help the lady, she thinks you're interested with her. And you can see she's struggling. She cannot turn the spanner. That's how wicked the world has been. But this gift brings you to a place of selflessness. You're not helping because you want to get something out of it. You're helping because you're exercising the gift, spiritual gift of ministry or service. Can I hear an amen? amen. Can I hear louder amen? amen? Paul wrote in Acts chapter 20 and verse 35, he says, I have shown you, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. Let's support the weak who are among us. Let's strengthen one another. Let us be a blessing to one another. Praise the Lord. Sometimes, instead of asking somebody, how are you? Ask them, do you have food? Do you have food? Are you okay? Is there food in your house? It's a blessing. Praise the Lord. It's a blessing. I remember during the lockdown, I used to call people, send messages to people, ask them, do you have food? Are you okay? Do you have food? Are you okay? Do you have food? And by the grace of God, we were really able to, as a church, to really bless families with food. Yeah. Because sometimes when you tell somebody, how are you? It's very difficult for them to tell you, I do not have food. They will say, I'm fine. So sometimes you can ask, do you have food? You know, when somebody goes like, eh, eh, it's like asking somebody, are you dating? When they go like, mm, eh, you know they are dating. <laughs> so ask somebody, are you ha do you have food? Are you okay? Are your children okay? Is your house okay? Is everything okay? Are you doing okay? Because there's a gift inside of you. Paul says, let's support the weak. In your own way, I'm not saying you give people five million, but in your own way at your level, you can exercise that gift and, and be a blessing to someone. Praise the Lord. You have rice in your house until now cockroaches are enjoying the rice. Yeah? Rats are enjoying the rice. It's too much. You can't eat all of it. And the person seated next to you, the last time they had a meal was Friday. Ask somebody, do you have food? Instead of, Allah, instead of letting your, the cockroaches in your house enjoy the meal, share the meal with your brother. Share the meal with your sister. It's a blessing. Hallelujah. Let's practice. Turn to your neighbor. Turn to your neighbor and ask your neighbor, do you have food? What did they say? Please, we are not asking if there is sausage in your house or not. We are asking, do you have... Some of you want to take it to the next level. They say, I don't have sausage, I don't have turkey, I don't have bacon, I don't have... Paul says, support the weak. Acts chapter 9. Verse 36 to 40, it gives us the story of a lady by the name Dorcas, or Tabitha. And the Bible says that at Joppa there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds. She was full of good works and charitable deeds in this church, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. Even good people become sick. And good people die too. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lida was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they, they brought him to the upper room. And all the widows stood by him, weeping, showing tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while he, she was with them. 
But Peter put them all out. He was moved and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. She was resurrected because of her good works. Not good looks. Good works. Why should we resurrect you when you die? Some people, when they die, we go like, Phew! One less devil in the church. The widows cried to Peter and said, Look at what she did for us. If it was not for Tabitha, the widows could not be dressing smartly in the church. She used her gift, the ministry gift of service and help, and she was making garments for the widows. When she died, they cried. They say, she cannot die now. Bring her back. Not yet. Eh? I'm sure some of them were showing Peter. You see, she had started working on my, my suit, and she did not finish. I must wear it. <laughs> Bring her back. And they were weeping and they were crying. Hallelujah. When you die, when people will be weeping, what will be making them weep? Should be a bigger reason. Should be a greater reason why they are crying. They should not just cry for the sake of crying. They should be crying because there is something that you did that touched their lives. You get what I'm talking about. So we should help one another. We should support one another. Praise the Lord. All the blessings that God is bringing your way is for you to be a blessing to somebody else. The gift of help, the gift of ministry, the gift of service is so that you may be able to help somebody else. Can I hear an amen? amen. That means I am even challenging some of you here. You will ask a brother, what is the school fees for your child? And you pay the school fees for that term. Yeah, you just pay it. Yeah, you just pay it. My sons, are you here? Some of these ladies have, they are single mothers and they are struggling. You can just ask one of them, what is the school fees for your child this year? Pay it. Not because you want to marry them, but because you are exercising the gift of service and ministry. Wow. It's powerful. I think we should close the service. <laughs> Number two. What is the purpose of the gift of ministry? Is to make you a supplier. It's to make you a supplier. All of us, as I've said, we have something to offer that will be beneficial to someone else. It can be your warmth, it can be your smile. It can be your voice, it can be your gift, it can be your ability, it can be your talent, it can be your resources. All of us have something to offer that can be able to change somebody's life. So this gift is to make you a supplier because many of us, we are just consumers. We are not contributors. But God has given all of us this gift through the Holy Spirit, so that we can become suppliers. There is something that you have to supply to the body of Christ. There is something you must supply to the church. There is something you must supply to your brother or to your sister. All of us, we have something to give. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16, the Bible says, From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. Every joint is supplying something. According to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So the Bible mentions here a, few, a couple of things here. Every joint supplies. Somebody say every joint supplies so everyone here you have to you have to supply something maybe you are the knee you are the kidney you are the liver you are the heart you are the voice you are the eyes you are the ears or you are the head you are supposed to supply something the reason why you are healthy your body is healthy is because every part of your body is supplying something the heart is busy pumping blood 
It's pumping. The day your heart says, I am tired. This guy has been pumping blood for him all these years. And he's never grateful. <laughs> the day your heart stops, you're gone. Even if you have 42 teeth, the day your heart stops, you are out of here. So you are healthy because your heart is working. Even when you are asleep, the heart is not sleeping. The, the, the heart cannot say, now this guy is sleeping. I think also we need to sleep. If it sleeps, you will never wake up. So every joint is supplying. You know, the, 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 the kidney is working, the liver is working. You know, your eyes are working, your ears are working. Right, right now, your ears are really working. I can even see the way they are really <laughs> at attention. Huh? Your eyes are working. Your body is working. You are receiving, you are listening. The moment part of your body refuses to supply to your body, there will be problems. You start having pain, you start having discomfort, you start feeling sickly. If you, before you know it, you are admitted, they inject you, they operate you, they try to correct the problem in your body, you know. So every part of your body is supplying, and it's the same with the church. We are supposed to supply to the body of Christ. So every joint must supply. And then the Bible says every part does its share. There is a share that you are supposed to do. In the church, in the body of Christ, every part does its share. Everyone has a unique contribution to the church. And then what is the ultimate? The ultimate is edification. The body is edified. Your contribution motivates, you know, your brother or your sister to serve God, to love God, to have an experience in the service, and that, that is what makes the entire body to be edified. Then what will happen? There will be growth. Somebody say growth. The church will grow. If all of you supply to this church, the church will just grow. Oh, yes. If all of you are actively involved in the church, the church will just grow. Because look, if, for example, this week, everybody here decides to bring one person to church this coming Sunday, what will happen? There will be growth, isn't it? Just one person. Everybody brings just one person. There will be growth. Without a flyer. Without advertisement. Without a crusade. Without a seminar. If all of you just bring one person, and by that I'm serious, next Sunday, all of you should bring one person. Tell your neighbor, pastor is very serious. All of you should bring one person, the, the church will do what? The church will grow. Paul makes a plea for Onesimus to Philemon. Philemon chapter 1, verse 8 to 12. This is what he says. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. You know, Onesimus used to work for Philemon, and then it looks like he stole from him and ran away. So when he ran away, he encountered Paul. I think he was in prison and he met Paul in prison. And Paul ministered to him and he got saved. So Paul started following his history. So Onesimus, where did you come from? What, what, who are you before you know you came here? So Onesimus started saying, oh, you know, Paul, I used to work for a guy called Philemon. And, you know, I stole from him. Paul said, now, now that you're born again, you have to go back and make things right with Philemon. Hallelujah. Amen. Some of you who stole from your employers before you are born again, you need to go back. <laughs> and tell your employer the milk that used to disappear every Wednesday. I was responsible. Anyway, so he writes a letter to Philemon. And he says, therefore, because Philemon was also born again. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, 
who became my son while I was in chains in prison. Formerly, he was useless to you. But now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. So initially he was useless. He was causing a lot of losses in Philemon's business. Stealing from him, manipulating figures. And then he found himself in prison. He met Paul. Paul preached to him. He got saved. Now Paul says, now he has become useful. So I'm sending him back to you, a changed man. And he's going to be useful, you know, to you. He had Philemon, ran away, but he met Jesus. He was saved, and now he became profitable to Paul. And Paul was sending him to be profitable. To who? To Philemon. So that he could supply good things. When he was with him, he was taking away things from him. And now he's sending him back so that he could supply good things to Philemon. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 19, verse 9 rather to 13, Paul writes to Timothy and he says, Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me. Don't you never tell them, I hope you'll not be a Demas. Hope you'll not forsake us. Having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica, Christians for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me in the ministry. And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus, Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Traos when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. So he says, Demas for Sukas, but bring Mark, because Mark is useful to me. There is something that Mark supplies to me. He's an encouragement to me. He is a supplier. Hallelujah. And Onesimus is being sent to Philemon to supply good things to Philemon. So the gift of service or the gift of ministry makes you a supplier. You supply something to make other people serve God more. You supply joy. You supply encouragement. You supply motivation. There's something you're giving to make the church better, stronger. Make us have a beautiful experience when we come to church. You put a smile on somebody's face. You are a supplier. First Corinthians chapter 16. I'll give you a lot of scriptures. First Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15 to 17. The Bible says, this is Paul writing to the Corinthian church. He says, I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanas. Please, there are more names, all right? that is the first fruit of Achaia, and that they were devoted, and they have devoted, rather, themselves to the ministry of the saints. The house of Stephanas, they devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints. They were always helping the saints. It's like her saying the house of Oanos. Hmm? Or the house of Liech. or the house of Meshach. They devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints. They were always ministering to the saints with no strings attached. That you also submit to such and to everyone who works and labors with us. I am glad about the coming of Stephanas, Fortunatus, and Achaicus. For what was lacking... On your part, they supplied. <laughs> they saw a gap in your life and they decided, we shall supply what these people need. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes you don't even need God to speak to you and say, uh, my daughter, uh, my son, 
look at this need supplied. Sometimes you can just see a need. You just look around and you can see a need. Yes. You can notice there's a brother who only has one trouser. One. One. It's a need. Supply for that need. Look at the way you're quiet. Or you're the brother with... <laughs> your silence is like you're the one. Supply for that need. You can see a sister with a wig since 2019. <laughs> Turn to a lady next to you ask her, uh, how old is your wig? <laughs> the only thing she does is to spray it. We have been given this gift to be a supplier. Look, the Bible says, Stephanas, Fortunators, and Achaeas, they saw what was lacking in people's lives. And they said, we are going to do what? To supply. For they refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, acknowledge such men. You don't need the gift of discernment to supply some things. You can just look around and you can see that there are people who need help. Hallelujah. Amen. There are people who need some shoes. Talk to me, somebody. You can see there's somebody who needs a shirt. Somebody who needs a trouser. Somebody who needs a suit. Look around, you can see. So don't look again and say, God, are you speaking to me? God, speak to me loudly. Shake my bed. Let a light shine in my bedroom. No. Be like Fortunatus and Stephanus. Look around. And when you see a gap, supply. May God raise suppliers in this church. I say may God raise suppliers in this church. We shall see needs and we shall do what? Hallelujah. Amen. We shall do what? We shall supply. Glory to God. I'm looking to, a, to a, a time when God will make us suppliers of even big things. Not just small things, but big things. We shall supply big things. Hallelujah. Oh yes. We shall, we shall bless our pastors with cars. We shall bless our fellow brothers and sisters with cars. Oh, yes. Why are you having four cars and you're not using some of them? Give. Give. Look for a brother here that you see very committed to the house of God. Give him. Hey. Very quiet today. You have an SQ. You have put old sofa sets that you're not using. They are on top of another. You have gone to a C group. There's a guy who is hosting a C group and you can see that his seats have undergone wear and tear. And you are part of the reason of the wear and tear. <laughs> and in your SQ, you have sofa sets on top of the other. Supply. Supply, supply, supply. You don't need them, supply. Fortunatus, Stephanus. They looked around and they saw, hey, there's a gap. I said, we shall supply to this gap. Hallelujah. When we get this message that I'm preaching today, because this is a gift for everybody, people in our midst will not sleep hungry. 
people in our midst will be smartly dressed. I'm telling you the truth. People in our midst will be happy to be part of this family because the gift of ministry is working. Can I hear an amen? amen. Look at anybody and tell them, can I have the, the seats? Can I? Can I? Can I have the seats? How many beds can you sleep on? Please talk to me. How many beds can you sleep on? You have so many beds. Some you are not using. They are under your bed. A bed on top of beds. A mattress on top of mattresses. The mattresses you have put on your bed, they are almost your height. Climbing the bed is a project. You're even buying a ladder for climbing to your bed. Supply. 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 I say supply. Supply. Be a supplier. Today when you go home, look around. The things you don't need. Supply. You have a hundred plates. Are you a restaurant? <laughs> Unless if you're planning to open a hotel. Are you a restaurant? Tell your neighbor, it's time to supply. Come on, touch them. Tell them it's time to supply. I pray that this week will be a week of supplying stuff. Supplying. Supplying, supplying, supplying. You will make calls and supply stuff to people. Oh, yes. Because of the gift of service. Gift of ministry. Mm. You, you, you want more? You can handle more. Number three, what is the purpose of this gift? Is to make or to help you is to help make supplications for others. Is to help make supplications for others. The first is to support the needy. The second one is to become a supplier. The third one is to help make supplication for others. You see, this gift works hand in hand with intercession. It makes you pray honestly, for other believers. It is not easy to pray for people because we are naturally selfish. In fact, praying for people, we pray, yes, but not passionate. But when it comes to ourselves, our own breakthrough, our own weddings, our own children, hey, the volume increases. Father, I have come. <laughs> But praying for people, we are very general. Father, pray for everybody. Pray for Kenya. Father, just remember Kenya, you know. Father, I've heard what is happening in Israel. Just remember those people. They like fighting. Just, just remember them, Lord, you know, and country. But Lord, right about now, I have come. I'm bringing my needs. My children, my stress, my problems. Oh, God! See me, see me, Lord, see me. Isn't it true? Lord, remember my wife. Lord, remember my husband. Oh, Lord, remember my children. Lord, remember my business. Oh God, I stand on your word. When you are praying for people, you are not saying I stand on your word. There was no scripture you quoted when you are praying for people. But when it comes to your needs, you say, Father, the Bible says. (laughs) 
<laughs> you will never leave me. You even start speaking in tongues. The tongues we have never had before. It's because generally and naturally we are selfish. We think about ourselves more than we think about others. But this gift is to remind you to make supplications for others. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 to 11. The Bible says, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength. This is Paul speaking. So that we despaired even of life. We we're almost thinking of dying because of the trouble, the problems, the issues that we went through. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us, you also helping together in praying for us. That thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. So this gift also makes you to pray for others. When you pray for others, you are serving them. When you pray for others, you are ministering to them. Paul says, you helped us in prayer. You are not there physically with us, but as you were praying, when we were facing the shadow of death, when we were in the valley of death, we were almost giving up, your prayer came in handy to assist us and to help us that we may not succumb to death. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul went through a lot. It is the prayer that helped him to survive. There was a day he was stoned to death. Then believers came and surrounded him in prayer. And he came back to life. Prayer is powerful. When you pray for somebody else, you are serving, you are ministering to them, you are refreshing them. That's why you should learn to pray for people. Don't just pray for yourself. Pray for your people. This gift of service has been given to all of us, the gift of ministry, and it involves making supplication for others. You stand in the gap and you pray for others because sometimes you might not know what somebody is going through, and so the safe thing to do is to pray for them. Look at your neighbor right now. Just look at them. Do they look like they have problems? They don't look like they have problems. Isn't it? Because when you have problems also, you don't want to show people you have problems. You try to put a brave face. Look at another neighbor. Look at them. Do they look like they are stressed? Do they look like they are frustrated? Do they even look single? <laughs> they don't. Unless you check their finger. It is true. Do they look jobless? Just look at your neighbor. Do they look jobless? Can you tell if your neighbor didn't have breakfast this morning? Look at them. You can't. And you'll be so surprised. Some of you are sitting next to somebody who is going through hell right now, is facing some serious battles right now. So the safe thing to do to minister to one another is by praying for them. You don't know what they're going through, but just pray for them. You see, these disciples who are praying for Jesus, the, 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 the members of the Corinthian church who are praying for Paul, they were not where Paul was. I am sure they didn't even know what Paul was going through. But Paul was staring at death. Paul was stressed. He was almost dying. And he said, it is your prayers that helped us. The moment we knew you were praying for us, we were strengthened. We were encouraged. We kept on moving. Yes, it was tough. Yes, it was difficult. But we kept on moving because we knew 
You are praying for us. So look at your neighbor and just tell them, pray for me. Turn to another and tell them, pray for me more than you gossip me. I don't need your gossip. I need your prayer. I don't need your discouragement. I need your prayer. Please pray for me. But we gossip more than we pray. Oh, did you see the way that lady is struggling? Did you see how that brother, I'm a chopper. Maisha ime mkalia. We find it easy to gossip, to talk. But we don't take time to do what? To pray. Tell your neighbor one more time, pray for me. As your pastor, I don't want you to gossip me. Please pray for me. Hallelujah. If you see gaps in my life, just pray for me. Because I'm also seeing gaps in your life. We all have gaps. Pray for me, I pray for you. You pray for me, I pray for you. As you're praying for me, you're ministering to me. As I pray for you, I am ministering to you. And that way the church will be stronger. Can I hear an amen? amen. Every spirit of gossip, we arrest you. Amen. We capture you. Amen. We throw you out of the window. There's no amen this side. What is going on? <laughs> Acts chapter 12, verse 1. Hmm. Acts chapter 12. I want to show you something powerful. Acts chapter 12. Acts, 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 Acts. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some. To harass some from the church. Then he killed. Hey! He killed James. The brother of John with a sword took his head, shoo, cut it off. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews. You see, the Jews were happy that James was killed. And because Herod was a politician, you know politicians play to the gallery. They decide, he decided, okay, let me go a step further and make the Jews more happy. And he arrested who? Paul. He arrested who? Peter. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now, it was during the days of unleavened bread. Verse 4. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison. The pastor of the church was arrested and put in prison. One of his elders had already been killed. And his life was at stake. He's in prison. But I love verse 5. Peter was therefore kept in prison. But what happened? Constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. The church decided we can't go to prison. It is risky, it is dangerous, but there is a place we can go to. And that is a place of prayer. And they started praying. And as they were praying, they were ministering to Paul. Sorry, to Peter. As they were praying, they were offering their services to Peter while he was in prison. Then what happened? Verse 6. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night, oh, Lord have mercy, he was planning to bring him out so that he may kill him. But thank God for the church that Peter was pastoring. Father, give me such a church. They prayed for him. And that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers. And the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Verse 7. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. He was free. Read the entire story. They walked out of the prison because of the prayers of the church. Let me tell you, what if the church gossiped Peter? Say, uh -huh. let's see if he's a man of God. Let's see who will save him. Uh -huh. Let's see. In fact, I think we should start thinking, we should start thinking of another pastor. Let's start, let's start thinking of replacing Peter as a pastor. No, the church did not do that. How many people have we killed because of gossip? Instead of prayer. How many people have we destroyed in our gossiping instead of praying for them? 
If the church did not pray, Peter could have been killed the same way James was killed. Please turn to your neighbor and tell them, don't gossip me, pray for me. Oh, they didn't hear you. Tell them loudly, don't gossip me, pray for me. Because when, pr- when we pray for one another, we are ministering to one another. When we pray for one another, we are protecting one another. When we pray for one another, we are covering one another. You never know. The prayer you make for your brother or your sister could even save them from suicide. Oh, yes. Yeah, could save them from accidents. Could save them from the wiles of the enemy. And that's why we should pray for people. Amen. All the gossipers in this church I'm preaching to you become prayer warriors. The energy you use to gossip, use it for prayer. The money you spend for buying coffee so that you may gossip, use that money to pray for people and to bless them. That is more beneficial than gossip. Uh, The gossipers are the ones who are not clapping. I'll say it again. Touch your neighbor one more time and tell them, pray for me. Shout it loud again. Tell them, pray for me. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, brethren, Paul says, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you. Look at verse 2. Who? And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For not all have faith. We have to pray for one another. We have to pray for our pastors. We have to pray for our children. We have to pray for our young people. It is the gift of ministry. It is the gift of help. It is the spiritual gift that the Spirit of God has given unto every believer to pray and to make supplication on behalf of others because they are wicked men that want to destroy our brothers and our sisters. They are wicked men that want to confuse my daughters. Please, we need to pray for my daughters. They are wicked women who want to confuse my sons. We need to pray for my sons. I thank God for one genuine man who has said yes. They are wicked men and wicked women that want to destroy our children. We have to pray. And I want to let you know, as long as the church is praying, Peter will come out of prison. As long as the church is praying, our children will be saved. As long as the church is praying, our marriages will be stable. Can I hear an amen in this house? Look at your neighbor one more time and tell them, pray for me. Don't gossip me. I don't need to be gossiped. I don't need somebody to backbite me. I don't need somebody to speak ill of me. I already have so many challenges that I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with COVID-19. I'm dealing with my business going down because of COVID-19. I'm dealing with school fees. I'm dealing with rent. I'm dealing with generally things not going on well because of the economy. Please, don't gossip me. Pray for me. I need your prayers. I need supplication coming from you towards my direction. Pray for me. That's all I need. If you can't give me money, just pray for me. It's the gift of ministry. Hallelujah. It is the gift of ministry. Don't discuss my marriage. Pray for me. Pray. Pray. Don't discuss my status. Pray. Pray. Pray for Zef. Pray for Ransom. Pray for Mark. Pray for Jeremy. Pray for virtuous man. Pray for Jane. Pray for Susan or Sue. Pray. Don't gossip. It doesn't help to gossip, but it helps to pray. (laughs) 
Number four. The purpose of this ministry is to restore serenity in the church. It is to restore serenity in the church. Huh. In Acts chapter 6, there was a problem in the church. It's amazing how the church can flourish and then one thing causes a problem. One thing. And in this church, it was food that caused a problem. Food is very emotive. Especially this part of the world, Africa. There's a lot of food insecurity. Hallelujah. People go for functions to eat. It's true. If I want to fill this service next Sunday, I just, I just make a flyer and say, lunch will be provided. They will come. They will not hear anything I say. They will be waiting for the end of the service. <laughs> Food is a very emotive issue. And you can see that in this church, there was a problem with food. The Hellenist widows, according to Acts chapter 6. Now in those days, the Bible says when the numbers of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. These were Greek-speaking Grecian Jews because their widows were neglected. You see, in the church that Tabitha belonged to, the widows were taken care of. At this church, the widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying please the whole multitude. When they talked about getting people who can serve, who can fill the gap that was in the church, the Bible says, the saying, please the whole multitude. When the idea of getting servants to serve the tables was mooted, I mean, everybody was up to say, ah, that's a great idea because the gap had been closed. Ladies and gentlemen, this ministry is to bring serenity. And all of a sudden, there was peace. People who were fighting for food stopped fighting for food because of the gift of service. Hallelujah. When the gift of service is in place, there will be serenity in the church. Look, even right now in this service, if I just come and throw food, there will be a commotion. If I just throw food, bacon, sausage, chapatis, ice cream, fruits. You will not be seated the way you are seated. <laughs> People will be jumping. You will see monkeys in human skin <laughs> grabbing whatever you can grab. But when there is order, there is serenity. These guys restored order. There was a gap and they filled the gap. When the gap was filled, the widows were fed, the young people were fed, the children were fed, and then there was serenity in the church. We need servants. We need servants. A lot of people who complain in the church is because they are seeing gaps. And I've said that before and I'll repeat again. When you see that gap, feel it. When you feel it, the complaint is diffused. Come on. The complaint is diffused. diffused. If you say, oh, I don't like the way they are singing, I don't, like, I, don't like the way, I don't like the way they stand and they are leading worship, come and show us how to stand and how to sing. When you show us, the complaint will cease. Come. Fill the cup! And there will be what? Serenity in the church. Can I hear an Amen. Oh, I don't like this guy. In this church, I think they don't stand with people. When people are going through something, I don't think they stand with them. Wait, and when there is a need, stand with people. 
Yeah, you go and stand with them the way you're supposed to stand. Maybe as we are standing awkwardly, you go and stand straight with them. And the complaint will see it. I don't like the way this church, I mean, look, people don't even come for weddings. Hey, this church, I think there's something wrong. You, you have seen it. Rally people to come for weddings. Rally them. Say you are going for a wedding. Rally them. Bring them. If you have a lorry, put them in the lorry. If you have a bus, put people in your bus. And say if there is free transport to attend this function, bring them. You can even do 10 trips. And the complain. We'll see. I'm preaching good in this house. When they suggested that let's get people who can fill this gap, who can fill this gap, the Bible says the saying pleased everybody and the church experienced serenity. Number five, I have two more, I have to rush. What is the purpose of this gift? Is for supplementing other gifts. Is for supplementing, supplementing other gifts gifts. What is a supplement? A supplement is something that is added to something else in order to improve it or complete it. So when you eat and you don't get some nutrients in your body, they give you supplements. The supplements are, are to add to the food. They add some of the things that you don't get in the food so that now your body can get all the nutrients that it needs for it to function optimally. So the gift of service is a supplement. Somebody say supplement. It is a supplement in the ministry. It is a great addition to other gifts for the effectiveness of the church. Like you see, today we had present worship. It's a supplement to the service. You came and worship, now I'm preaching to you. The worship supplemented my preaching. My preaching is now supplementing the worship. But before you entered here to enjoy the worship, you met somebody at the gate. Then you met somebody at the door. All right? Then you sat on clean seats. So we are talking about supplementing other gifts. We are working hand in hand with other gifts. When we talk about the gifts of help or ministry, it's complementing other gifts. We are not competing, but we are complementing one another. There is something that it is adding to other gifts so that these gifts can be able to do what? To flourish. The apostles summoned the multitude of the disciples and they said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good re reputation, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business to supplement our preaching and teaching of the word of God. And he says, We shall give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. They needed the gift of the ministry or service or helps to supplement their calling. Men who serve in a supporting role do so much more in the background that we might not even see to make what you see glamorous and nice. Can you imagine if I was everywhere? I wake up in the morning, I go to Taj Mahal to organize for buses. I wait for you. Then you enter the bus. Then we come. <laughs> I make sure you have settled. I take the second trip going back to Tajmo to organize the second trip to come. Then I come. Then I organize the classes. Then I finish. Then I go to the kitchen to try and cook. For what you will eat after this service. Hmm? Then after that, dress quickly to come and preach. When I'm done preaching, I tell you, wait, I go and change because I need to serve you in the restaurant. I go and change and wear my apron. What will happen? I'll collapse. I will die. And it will not be the devil. It will be, it will be because I do not recognize the ministry of helps that supplement my calling. So I don't have to go to Tajmo because there's somebody there. So he will supplement my calling. 
I don't have to be in all the classes teaching. They are teaching, they are teachers, they are teaching to supplement my calling. I don't have to play all the instruments. They are people who are playing the instruments to supplement my calling. So that when I come, I have my punch. I'm on the cutting edge. So these gifts are to supplement other gifts so that those gifts can be able to function optimally. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So that means if you don't do anything in the church, you're not complimenting my calling. Maybe you're even sabotaging my calling. Because there's a gap you're supposed to fill and because you're not filling it, my calling or my preaching is not experiencing the maximum impact that it needs to experience. Because you never tell them I'm a supplement. During COVID-19, there are two supplements that were very, very, um, they were on high demand, zinc and, and vitamin C. In fact, you go to a place where when you try to get vitamin C, it was very difficult to find. Vitamin C and zinc. All right. Everybody wanted to buy vitamin C and zinc. Vitamin C and zinc. There are pastors who even call me and say, where can I get these vitamins? I need to take them. Yeah, I need power and vitamins. <laughs> and the reason why they were taking the vitamins is because the vitamins were boosting or the vitamins boost your immune system so that when the virus comes, you can be able to fight the virus. So if you've not been taking vitamin C, please, from today, start taking vitamin C and a lot of zinc. It boosts your immune system so you can fight COVID-19. And we are winning this war in Jesus' name. I say we are winning this war in Jesus' name. And so... These supplements are to add what is lacking in your body because COVID-19 fights a, 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 an immune system that has been compromised. But when you strengthen it, you know, sometimes you might not even know if you got it or not. Just think it is a flu and you shake it off. So in the church, we don't need viruses. We need supplements. Oh, you're not getting what I'm saying. I say we don't need viruses. We need what? So ask your neighbor, are you a virus or you are a supplement? Should become a supplement. You make the church stronger. Hallelujah. You make the church effective. You make the church fulfill her mandate here on earth. Because you are not a virus. You don't come to compromise the stability of the church. You come to boost the strength, the effectiveness of the church. May all the supplements shout a big amen in the house. <laughs> Number six, the last one. For the success of the ministry. Why do we have this gift? The gift of ministry is for the success of the ministry. When the gift of service is in operation, the church will explode in numbers. The Bible says in verse 7, after they chose this man to serve tables, to complement, you know, the ministry of the apostles, the Bible says, then the word of the Lord spread, the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. A church that is full of participators than it is of spectators grows tremendously. It will grow. The Bible says the word of God multiplied. There was success in the ministry. And even the priests, they turned to Jesus. They got saved. They became obedient to the faith. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that when we kick in this gift, which everybody has, the ministry will flourish. The word of God will grow. Lives will be changed. People will be healed. Miracles will take place. Amazing things will take place in this commission because everybody has filled all the gaps that are in the ministry. Acts chapter 13 is a story of Paul and Barnabas. They were prayed for. There was a prayer and fasting meeting. 
in Antioch, in the church in Antioch, and they were praying, and then the Holy Spirit said, separate me, Paul, and who? And Barnabas, and then they laid hands on them and released them to go. Now from verse 4, the Bible says, beam it up, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they were sent by the Holy Spirit, they went down to, to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Then what happened? Verse 5. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also, read that with me, they also had John as their assistant. They were sent by the Holy Spirit, but there was somebody assisting them. There was somebody making sure they, are, they were comfortable. There was somebody who was offering practical, practical service to them. When they needed water, when they needed food, when they needed to book a place to sleep, when they needed to rest, there was somebody who ensured that they were comfortable. He offered practical ministry or practical service. He was helping them so that they may be able to fulfill their calling. Look, when they were being prayed for, the Spirit of God did not say, separate for me Paul, Barnabas, and John. No. The Spirit of God says, separate for me uh, Paul and Barnabas. But now they took John to be in their lives as a servant, fulfilling the gift, the spiritual gift of ministry. And because of that, what happened? Give me the next, the, the next verse, verse 6. Verse 6. Verse 6. Verse 6. Now when they had gone through the islands to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew who, whose name was Bar-Jesus, Last Sunday I told you we have so many Jesuses. This is another one. Verse 7. Who was with the pro proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man? This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. Verse 8. But Elimas, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Paul and Barnabas are preaching to this guy and this other guy, Bar-Jesus, <laughs> is telling the guy whatever they are telling you is not true. Like one time I was preaching here and there was a Bar-Jesus in, in this church. As I was preaching, the Bar-Jesus was also preaching to the neighbor, telling the neighbor what I'm saying is not true. Bar-Jesus. Ask your neighbor, you are bar Jesus. Verse, verse, verse 9. Verse 9, verse 9, verse 9. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him, verse 10, and said, All full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. So I can call somebody son of the devil. Tell your neighbor, see your matusi. Will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? Verse 11. And now, indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind. Eesh. Father, give me this anointing. Lord. You shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him. And he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Verse 12. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. You see, this was able to take place because Paul and Barnabas, as much as they were sent by the Holy Spirit, there was John by their side. Offering practical ministry. John was not preaching. John was not prophesying. John was not calling people son of the devil. John was not uh, telling people you will never see again. John was just there to say, Paul, what do you need? Do you need water? What is the temperature? Okay, done. Are you hungry, Paul? Barnabas, are you tired? Your room is ready. You can go and sleep. And because of that, they were able to succeed in the ministry. And that's what I'm saying. It is a ministry that sometimes is not seen, but it's very powerful because it makes other gifts shine. 
It makes the ministry become effective. Father, I pray may you raise people who can function in this gift in the name of Jesus. I pray that may you raise people who can begin to manifest this gift in the house of God. Can you shout a big amen? amen. As I finish Malachi chapter 3 and verse 18, the Bible says, Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked. Tell your neighbor, don't be wicked. Be righteous. And then between one who serves God and one who does not serve God. You stay. Don't serve. Sit on your gift. Just say it was a nice message. And don't do anything about it. But five years down the line, there will be a difference between you and the person who is serving. Ten years down the line, there will be a difference between you who is just seated there and you have dropped your glasses almost to the tip of your nose and you're looking at me with intelligent eyes and you don't want to do anything in the house of the Lord. You stay, but in five years' time, ten years' time, there will be a distinction between you and the people who are serving God. I wish I can get a witness in this house. There will be a distinction. Oh, my goodness. Look at your neighbor and tell them, keep on serving God. I don't know what you're doing in this church, but I came to encourage you this morning. Engage the gift of service. Keep on serving the law. Don't faint. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Keep on serving the law. One of these fine days, there will be a line of demarcation on the side be people who serve God. And on the other side will be the people who don't serve God. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, when you start saying, God blessing me, don't be jealous of me. Do what I do and you will have what I have. I'm blessed because I serve God. I am prospering because I serve God. I am healthy because I serve God. Can I hear an amen in this house? If you're in the high serve team, shout out louder. Yeah. yeah! Exodus chapter 23 and verse 25 to 26. The Bible says, So you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water. I prophesy blessings to every I serve team member, every man that is serving God. I prophesy the blessings of the Lord. May your bread be blessed. May your water be blessed. May everything you ingest in your body be blessed. Shout a louder amen in this house. Look at your neighbor if you're sure they are serving God and tell them you are blessed. Tell another one, your bread is blessed. Don't just tell anybody. Tell somebody that you're sure that they are serving God. Tell them your bread is blessed. Your water is blessed. My God goodness i can never have typhoid my water is blessed because i serve god i can never succumb to food poisoning because i serve god my bread is blessed shout a better yeah shout a louder yes and the bible says and i will take sickness disease covid 19 Malaria, typhoid, kidney failure, leukemia, HIV, migraines, whatever disease it is, as you serve God, God says, I will take it away from your body, from your house, from your children. The devil is a liar. I cannot serve God and I'm sick. The moment I decided I'm serving God, no disease, no sickness, no pain is permitted in my body. Shout a better yes. Shout a louder yes. Please do something for me. Look around. If you're sure somebody is serving God, tell them you are healed. 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 
this is not for everybody this is for those who serve God tell them you are healed you are healed you are healed your disease is healed your sickness is healed your pain is healed you are healed from the top of your hair to the sole of your feet every germ every disease every virus die right now in the name of Jesus I am a servant of God I am a servant of God I am a servant of God I promise you keep serving with all your heart you will never see the hospital you will never take medicine because the word of God is true when you serve him sincerely he will take sicknesses diseases ailments away from your body shout a better year so if you tell me pastor I don't know what is happening. My malaria comes in July. My typhoid comes in August. It is at this time that I feel like this. My next question is, are you serving God? Mm -hmm. Are you serving God? We've been praying for people to be healed who are not even doing anything for God. No wonder your healing has delayed. Because God doesn't just want to heal you so that you stay, eat, belch and go home and do nothing why don't you negotiate with him tell him God if you heal me I will serve you all the days of my life my time my resources my gifts my talents I will use them to serve you and see what God will do in your life serve the Lord serve the Lord it will take sickness away from the midst of you by your service by your service in the house of God sickness is not permitted even in your house your children cannot be sick your husband cannot be sick your are you hearing what I'm talking about this they cannot this is a promise in the word of God but you're not doing anything you can't move a chair. You can't sweep. You can't plant a tree in the church. You can't help with the speakers. No wonder you're always sickly. You're always weak. You're always having a migraine. You're always having a headache. You're always seeing a doctor. You're always visiting not just a doctor, but witch doctors. Because you're thinking you're bewitched. I introduce you to another medicine. It is called serving God. You take one pill in the morning, another pill in the afternoon, another pill in the evening. You take the pill on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, on Friday, on Saturday, on Sunday, on Monday. All the time, you are serving God. We find you serving God in your office, in your house, in your home, in the church. You are serving God. Sicknesses will say, that one we cannot touch. Even God will not allow sickness to touch you. Because he knows you are a pillar in his house. Look at your neighbor for me and tell them, serve God, serve God. Can we finish the scripture? No one shall suffer miscarriage. You will not get a baby and the baby comes out. You will not get a job and you lose the job. You will not get a blessing and you lose the blessing. You will not get a bonus at the place of work and you lose the monies. By serving God, you are taking care of God's business. And if you take care of God's business, he will take care of your, of your business. You shall not suffer. Miscarriage, because you serve God. Or be barren in the land do i have servers in the house you will not be barren you will prosper when you do farming you will prosper when you keep animals you will prosper when you start a business it will prosper 
When you start a church, it will prosper. You will not be barren in the name of Jesus. This morning I came to tell you, serve God. Serve God. Serve God. I'm pleading with you, serve God. I'm calling you higher, serve God. And all these blessings will come upon you. Go over to five people and just tell them, serve God. Serve God. Serve God. Serve God. Serve God. My God, serve Him. Serve Him. Serve Him. Serve Him. Give your time. Give your resources. Give your money. Give your talents. Serve God. And the Bible says, and the number, the number, the number of your days here on earth, you will fulfill. The number of your days here on earth, you will fulfill. That means if God has not said, I should die, even COVID-19, it cannot take me out. I still have some messages to preach. I still have some churches to plant. I still have some things to do for God. The number of your days you shall fulfill. Hallelujah. As you serve God, may you cross 70 with ease. Cross 80 with ease. May you fulfill the number of your days here on earth in the name of Jesus. Look at your neighbor and tell them, I shall not die young. Oh, they didn't hear you shout to their ears and tell them, I shall not die young. Because I'm serving God. I refuse to die now. I refuse to go to the grave now. I cannot die now. Because I'm serving God. I have to fulfill the number of my days here on earth. I will serve him. I will serve him. I will serve him. I will serve him. I will fulfill the number of my, my days. Ladies and gentlemen, I call upon you to serve God. You've been sitting in church for long, doing nothing. Attending a service is not serving God. You need practical service. That is towards making the church fulfill her mandate. And that is the great commission. You have to do something with your life for God. I want to give you one minute to talk to somebody next to you and ask them which department are you in? If they are stammering, bring them here right now. If they are saying, I'm thinking, I've been thinking, I have been planning, I have been praying, bring them here. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're in this church and you're not in any department, I am very serious now. I want you to come here. We want to induct you in a department. We want you to serve God. You are in this church. You are not in a department. You are a member of this church. Come now. Come, 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 come. Come. You are not in any department. Come here. Do we have those forms? I want to give them. You must serve God. It's a gift. It's a gift. Is this Joseph? What's your name? Huh? Philip. Philip. What's your name? Frank. Frank. What's your name? Huh? Bravin. Bravin. You must serve God today. Come. Please, when you stay there, what are you trying to show God? Huh? Don't be wiser than God. You are not in any department. You just come, enjoy the service and go. 
and you're claiming long life, how will it happen? With long life, you will start it, and you're not doing anything for God. How will it happen? You have to serve him. This church will not be a church of spectators. To be a church of participators. You have to do something for God. Are those forms ready? Give them. Give them, give them quickly. With long life, you will satisfy me. Those who are remaining, look around. If you look, if you see somebody who looks suspicious, they are not in any department, you go and bring them here. And if you are there, you are not in a department, walk and come. Everybody must do something in the house of God. That's the altar call. There is no altar call for another breakthrough. This is the altar call. As you get that form, read it. Because I'm going to pray for you. Then you're going to go back with that form. You're going to feel it. After you feel it, don't go with it at home. I don't know how we can do this. Woo. All right. Let me pray for you. You will go back with the form. You will feel it when I finish the service. All right? I will tell you where to go to meet the HODs. HODs, are you here? Oh? Huh? HODs? And by the way, HODs, you've been letting me down. I give you people, you don't follow them up. You don't call them. You don't induct them in the ministry. Why are you becoming a stumbling block? You're like a Pharisee standing at the door. You don't want the ones who are out. To come in. God can remove you. Don't be a stumbling block. What we are doing here is very serious. This is life changing. If you are given names as a head of department, let me rebuke the HODs a bit. Take it seriously. Follow up. Call those people. Make sure they're inducted in the department. God will require their blood on your hands. Because you stood at the door to block them from serving God. So don't take it lightly. So all the HODs, I'm going to send these people to you after the service. Follow up, encourage, motivate the departments they have chosen so they can be inducted and begin to function in Jesus' name. All the HODs say amen. amen. Hey, Mukoengi. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for this new harvest, laborers, that you are bringing into the field to work, to work for you, to serve you, to exercise the gift of service, the gift of ministry. I pray, oh God, that they will fit in the departments. I pray they will use their talent, their time, their resources, and serve you wholeheartedly. 
I pray, O oh God, that none of them will fall by the wayside. As they get inducted in these departments, I pray that they will fit in. They will find a loving family. And they will become united with that family and become one so that they may serve you. Give them strength. Give them grace. I pray for fresh oil and fresh anointing upon their lives. That as they start this journey of serving you, they will never at any point give up on the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we celebrate these new people who are joining the workforce? Please go back. After the service, I will tell you where to go. I'll call you back here again. Can we celebrate them one more time? Hey, Chodis, did you hear me? Style up, all right? Every eye closed, you're here, not born again. I want to lead you to Christ. Is there anybody who is not saved and you're here? You're saying, Pastor, pray for me to give my life to Christ. I always love to do this before I let you go. Are you here? You're not saved. You're not born again. Shoot your hand up. I'll pray for you. You're not born again. You're not saved. You're here. Are you there? Shoot your hand up pray for you. All right. Be seated. <laughs>